progress. Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Yavamo Daf Kaf Vav. Uh, we're going to continue, finish the second, we're going to actually finish the second parrot, continue with this interesting topic we began yesterday about people who are suspected of having relation, of, of lying in order to be able to be in a relationship with a woman, lying about either that she's divorced, lying, right, that she had a valid divorce, lying that her husband died, lying that she, that he tried, he basically forbade her to her husband based on a, a vow, right? Certain situations where basically we're worried that he's doing this in order to make her a free woman so that he can marry her. So now the mission is going to be all of a sudden permitting in certain cases. The mission at the top of Kafav says, mm-hmm. If they had wives, and meaning if this person was happily married, or we don't know happily or not, but he was married, and his wife just happened to die, then we're not worried that he killed his wife just to do this. It reminds me of a movie, Black Widow, where she basically keeps killing her husbands in order to um, get their money, right? And nobody really suspects her because nobody really thinks. It takes them a while to get onto her because nobody really thinks that people kill their spouses for, you know, money, for relationships with other people, right? It's not common. So therefore, we're not worried. And likewise, Kulan he permitted her to go marry everybody else. She's just forbidden to him. So if they married other people, and then in, a, in the interim, once he permitted her, she went and married somebody else, and then she got divorced or widowed, at that point, they can already marry them. We saw this two dapim ago, two pages ago, where we just had with the woman who was divorced in between, right, married someone else and was divorced when there was a suspicion with Shimon, right, with the other person, and then she then marries him, right, then she, there's less of a concern if she was with someone in the interim. And not only that, but if they permit them, they're only forbidden to them, they're not forbidden to their close relatives like their brothers or their sons. We'll see later, why doesn't it mention fathers? We'll see later what exactly the concern is, right? You would think the concern is that maybe he's lying on their behalf. That doesn't seem to me what the Gemara thinks is the concern. The Gemara thinks the concern is, and it's, in the end they permit it, it's not a concern at all. But the reason why they need to mention it is because maybe if it's your brother, you're going to see her a lot. And if you really have a thing for her, then maybe you'll end up having a relationship with her. And maybe we should avoid you having such close contact with her. So we're also going to compare it to another similar case where we do forbid relatives. And here we don't. And why is that? So the Gemara first, there's three sections to this Gemara until we finish the second chapter. So the first line was, if they had wives and then their wives died, it seems like if their wives died, but not if they got divorced, because presumably if they got divorced, right, the man divorces his wife, well, why did he divorce his wife if not to get to this other woman? It's definitely reason to suspect when there's divorce. So Armalei Rav Hillel Rav Ashi, wait a minute, but this inference contradicts an explicit brayta. Even if they got divorced, he could still marry her. So Lokash, the Gemara says, don't worry. This is when there was a conflict between them already, and this is when there wasn't a conflict between them. Actually, I shouldn't even say already. Let's just say conflict between them versus no conflict between them. This is a very strange answer because, as often happens with this, when we say one is in this case, one is in that case, there's a big debate about which is which. If he was already fighting with his wife beforehand, then maybe there's more likely that he actually had eyes for this other woman, and that's why he was fighting with his wife. And that's when you're not allowed. But you are allowed if there were no, there was no fighting between him and his wife. And then, you know, they got divorced, presumably for some other reason. Well, obviously, that sounds a little weird. Why were they getting divorced? Some people say, right, and if they just got divorced without this fighting, well, then he can marry the other woman. Some people say, no, it's the exact opposite. If they were fighting all the time anyway, then it's not because of this woman that they were getting divorced, in which case he can marry the other woman if he wants later. But if there was no fighting before and then all of a sudden... They just go and get divorced, right? Uh, he makes, he says, oh, listen, I want to divorce you and gives, gives her a get. Well, then maybe it's because of this other woman. Then it would be forbidden. So that's the opposite. The Me'iri takes a different stance. And that's why I stopped myself when I said they were, were when I said it before about uh, they were fighting before, the Me'iri says maybe it's, were they fighting after or not? In other words, if there was fighting, there was no fighting before, but then the fighting started after he testified against her, then maybe there's concern or around that time that he's doing it to make a fight with her so that they could get divorced so that he can marry the other woman. So that's a third possible, it's not exactly a third possibility, but it's a different way of understanding it. So it's an interesting thing in and of itself, how much, right, what would cause one to be more suspicious or not? Fighting, yes, fighting, no fighting. Anyway, that's just interesting. Be bite, Emma. Have a 
And maybe it's where there wasn't any fighting really beforehand. And now the issue is when they go to get divorced now, the low kasha, had to argue who had to argue la he. Who's the one who's really initiating the breakup? Which is interesting because this shows women were initiating divorce also. Who's the one who's starting the fights? Is it she starting the fights or is it he starting the fights? If she's starting the fights, then we're not really suspicious of him that he's gone with some other woman. Unless, of course, she's starting the fights because she's suspicious of him. But the assumption here is she's the one who starts to be unhappy in the marriage as opposed to him being unhappy in the marriage. If he's unhappy in the marriage, that's an indicator because maybe he has eyes on some other woman. If she is, right? This whole suga in general is very interesting in terms of making assumptions about human behavior, which is fascinating in and of itself. Um, and what assumptions we can make that would cause us to be suspicious or not. Wait till we get to the end of this sugya, which is actually going to be a little bit difficult to swallow as well, but um, hold off, we're almost there. Vikulan shinisu. Now the second part we're going to deal with is if they married other people and then got divorced or widowed, then they can marry him. So again, the Gemara says, well, they're going to make an assumption and then question that assumption. We thought when we read this, mita, mita, gerushin, gerushin. And now we're going to get off on a totally different topic, which is the topic of chazaka. How many times you need to do something to establish it is this is a done deal. And then there's all sorts of ramifications. There's a big basic machlok. Is it two times or three times? Something happens three times, we assume it's going to happen. That's what we call chazaka. But Rebbe holds it's even after two times. What does this have to do with anything? So let's go back and see. They assume, now this is a strange assumption why they would assume this, but maybe it just means you assume it could be read this way, which means that mita, mita, there were different cases. Either he testified she, that her husband died in the previous Mishnayot or that they got divorced. So if he testified that they died and then she marries someone else and he died, okay, that could be a possibility. And another possibility was, or he testified that she was divorced and then she married someone else and got divorced. Again, whether or not you have to assume that they thought that was the case, or at least that could be the case, right? It seems reasonable that those are possibilities because there's all sorts of permutation. He testified she was divorced and then she got married and, and, and widowed, or he testified she got, she was, her husband was dead and then she went and got married and got divorced, right? We could do that. We could do all the possibilities or mita, mita, it was both about death or both about divorce. What's the difference? What's the relevance? Well, there's a halacha that if a woman, this goes back to the Black Widow movie, if a woman has a husband who dies, she's married twice and the husband dies twice, then there's an issue. Okay, now only if you're held by Rebbe, but if it happens three times, then she's muhzeket as a woman whose husband's dying, you're not supposed to marry her. But if the chazaka is at two times, then you can't marry her after two deaths. So this would basically mean, okay, that according to this, if you say it's mita and mita, and then he can marry her, that means obviously we could say our mission doesn't hold like Rebbe because Rebbe wouldn't allow the marriage because she already has two husbands dead. So, right, I don't think it's that they're worried necessarily he's killing her, but maybe it's a little bit of superstition, you know, that this happened already three times. She's killed three husbands or according to Rebbe too, right, maybe she's, you know, for whatever reason, something's causing their death. To eek Rebbe, Hamar betrays Zimne, Havi Chazaka, right? If it's Rebbe, Rebbe holds two times the Chazaka and it would, then we would say our mission doesn't hold like him. So they say, lo, mita, gerushin, ba gerushin, mita. You could say, it's trying to a case where one was about death and one was about divorce. One was about divorce and the other was about death. Uh, the other one was about death. So it could be explained in other ways and therefore it doesn't prove anything about Rebbe or not. Generally, we don't hold like Rebbe. Chazak is three times, not two. Vikulan mutarot libnehem ola achehem. So now they want to know, my shnah me How is it different from the following Mishnah? Hanit an mina isha. If somebody is suspected of being with another woman, so we say it's actually, uh, it says Hatnan, but I think it's a Tosefta. It's in the Tosefta. Someone suspected of sleeping with another woman, Asul bi'ima u'bibitao ba'achota. He's not allowed to sleep with her mother, her sister, or her sis or her daughter. Okay, her mother, her daughter, her sister. Now, what's the issue? Right? It means like he can't marry them. What's the concern of marrying any relative of hers? Right? We don't know really if he had a relationship with her, but we have rumors. We're worried that if, what's going to happen? If she goes to their house a lot, because she's close with her mother, her sister, her daughter, she hangs out there a lot, then he'll be around her a lot, and he might end up in a relationship with her, right? If he really has an eye for her, and they were suspected of having done something together before, there's more concern of it if, Right? He shouldn't marry any of her close relatives because they'll be in proximity to each other. 
So here, why are we not concerned about that? In this case, we say he can marry. The woman can marry his brother or his his uh, his brother or his son. So why do we not allow it in the woman case? So they're going to make a bunch of different assumptions about women and men. Some of them will be okay to swallow. Some of them may be a little difficult. This I, I could get. Women are more likely to be at their sister's house, at their mother's house, or their daughter's house, but men much less likely. Why? First of all, think about their society. In their society, the women were home all day doing the laundry, doing the water from the well. They probably lived not far from each other, and they were often in each other's houses, taking care of the children together, sharing the tasks. Whereas the men were out working in the in the shuk, in the marketplace, in the you know in boats, and they were traveling. It, they didn't have as much free time to be going and hanging out in people's houses. So if your son is married to this woman that you have eyes for, you're not so much in your son's house. It's not such a big deal. But if your you have eyes for your wife's mother and she comes to the house a lot, there's a likelihood that something might happen. That's the first answer. Inami, this is a little more difficult. Nashe de lo aschan shchivatana hadade lo kapte hadade. There's no, I'll put it in halachic terms because I think it makes the most sense that way. It's hard to understand in emotional terms. But in halachic terms, and this is really what the Gemara is saying, women don't forbid other women on them. What does that mean? That means if a man is married to a woman and he has eyes for his mother, and while his mother comes to visit, he sleeps with the mother, okay? Or, or worse, right? He's married to the mother and he molests the daughter. Okay, we're talking about the daughter of the mother, not his own daughter. So now, right, in the, in the field, right, we can view this. The most where my mind wanders to is, is child molesting, right? Or, or things like that, or relative molesting, because that's, it's the most common thing. It happens in the house because people are in the house all the time. So it's really, it, it's disturbing, but it's actually super relevant today because this unfortunately really still goes on. So what they're saying here is like this. If this is happening, in the woman's house, where her husband's with some other woman, right, her relative, she's not going to, okay, now again, it's very difficult to say this, she's not going to stop him, really. Now, why not? Because halachically, there's no relevance to her. Why? If he sleeps with her daughter, okay, she doesn't, right, normally, if, if she's a, okay, we're going to see the flip side. If she's a married woman and some man sleeps with her, she has to get divorced from her first husband and she has to get divorced from the p person who had relations with her now. So that's going to mess up the husband. But here it doesn't mess up the wife, really. I mean, the truth is you're not allowed to sleep with a woman and her daughter. So I don't really know how we get around that one. But the fact is, he, it doesn't mean that she's going to have to divorce her. So because of that, um, she's not going to make a big issue of it. One other way to view it is, is unfortunately, which happens very often, is the mother just doesn't, right, if let's say the father's molesting a child in the house, like let's say it's not his child and it's her child, she'll turn her face sometimes. It's unfortunate. It's horrible. And it's horrible to think that this would go on. But it unfortunately does, right? Sometimes the husband's more strong in the house and she doesn't know what to say to him and she kind of suspects something's going on, but she doesn't really know how to or what to, or she just doesn't notice, which is also a possibility. But here they're saying... They, it, because it doesn't affect her in any way. Now, of course it affects her. It affects her emotionally. It affects her in so many ways. But in a halachic way, she won't have to get divorced. So she's going to be do less about it. Again, this is very difficult uh, to swallow. But gavrin, the asrin, shchibatana adade, kapta adade. But if this guy comes in, let's say you're the man of the house, and you have this woman that you're married to, your wife, and then comes in your father, who has eyes for your wife, you're going to make sure that he doesn't sleep with your wife because if so, you're going to have to divorce her, right? You're the man, remember? So you're going to have to divorce her. Of course, you're going to make sure that doesn't happen because that's la halacha. You're going to have to divorce your wife if she was with some other man. So because of that, kapte hadadi, he's never going to let this kind of thing happen. Plus, men are a bit tougher about this, right? In terms of, again, especially in those days, right? Not to say this wouldn't the women, I'm sure there's plenty of women who would make a big deal about this. I'm not saying no women would, but they're saying as a general rule, and certainly in their society, things were very different. So then the Gemara says, well, why doesn't it put his father on the list? That would be also, right? His father can marry because there's less, right? His father's not going to tolerate his son sleeping with his wife. So why wouldn't you put that on the list? 
So they say, lo me vaya kama. It's included in there. It just didn't bother saying it because it's obvious. Lo me vaya aviv to buzz his bene The son is certainly embarrassed in front of his father to do this. He has respect for his father. Of course, he's not going to sleep with his father's wife. Aval beno to lo buzz his aviv mine. But maybe the son who may be, right, a son who would be nervous to do something and say something against his father, Emalo, you might have thought not. Kamash Malan. The Mish is telling you, even a son is going to stop his father from doing that and make sure having a no tolerance policy when it comes to his father coming into his house trying to sleep with his wife. Okay, again, this whole thing you would imagine people don't have a tolerance policy for any of it, but the Gemara tries to make these distinctions men and women. Again, number one, I want to just put in perspective of their society. Number two, I want to say that there's. Um, a difference, sometimes the Gemara comes up with theories, like we did before, with the Ketata, where they come up with a theory, you can prove it this way, you can prove it that way. It's not the most convincing answer. It's just a way to resolve a contradiction. Maybe there's other ways, and they just didn't realize what they were. But these are just possible answers. It doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean they act upon these things. They're just trying to kind of establish, when we have contradictory sources, how can we resolve them? And they come up with creative ways to resolve them. It doesn't always necessarily mean that that is a fact, okay? They're using it as a theory. Try to come up with, how can we resolve a contradiction? So you can also view this a little bit in that way, and then say, oh, well, it's not necessarily the truth. It's just a possible way of understanding things. And with that, Hadron Alach Ketzad Eshet Achiv, and then very strange place, Anyway, we're now going to start our new Mishnah, which we've actually seen a number of times. So I'm hoping at this point, this case will be very clear to you because we've seen it a bunch of times and now we're going to review it and see it inside. So we have four brothers, Reuven, Shimon, Levi, and Yehuda, and there are two of them are married to two sisters, Rachel and Leah. So now, what happens? So Reuven marries Rachel, Shimon marries Leah, and Yehuda and Levi are just there. Now, so now, Reuben and Shimon die. We actually saw two different possibilities. Is this that they died at the same time, or is it that they died one after the other? But either way, what happens? When Reuben and Shimon die, Rachel and Leah both have Zika to Levi. This is at least the first way to understand our Mishnah. And Rachel and Leah have Zika to Yehuda, because each one has two sisters. You can't marry Achotz kukato, right? Two sisters on a Durabana level, and there, right? You can't marry. I'm sorry, the, you can't marry two sisters on the Torah level, but you can't. If you have Zika to one, you can't marry the other. That's Durabana because Zika is all Durabana. So therefore, you do chalitza to both women. Okay, they have to do chalitza. They can't marry them. The im can move a kinsu. What if they didn't really know the halacha? And Levi got up and did Yibum with Rachel, and Yehuda did Levi with Leah. Now remember, when they marry one of them, the Zika of her to the other person is gone. So at this point, it actually could be okay, but, right, Im could move a kansu yotziu. They basically say, no, you have to divorce them, okay? Because, right, you're not allowed to, basically, the issue is that you went against the halacha here, and we don't let you stay married. For Rabbi Eliezer, remember, you could see why there would be a machloket, because theoretically you could say, well, there's no Zika anymore, right? So, or you could say maybe there's no Zika at all, in which case it's not a problem. So Rabbi Eliezer, remember, according to Beit Shammai, this actually works. You could stay married. It's not a problem. And Beit Hillel says, no, you actually have to divorce them. Okay, you can't stay married to them. Um, okay, so now I want to point out two things. First of all, it's interesting. Rabbi Eliezer, it's not clear if he's the only one who thinks they argue about this. Some people say, why is he bringing Beit Shammai's opinion if we don't hold that way? Some people say it's because maybe some people think that Beit Hillel was the one who said that and they flip the opinion, so he wants to say this is the tradition. Maybe he, maybe Tanakama agrees with him and he's just specifying that what Tanakama brought is only Beit Hillel's opinion, just so you know Beit Shammai disagrees, which is very similar to the first chapter where we learned all about the Tzarot and then we said, oh, Beit, Beit Shammai doesn't hold by this at all. So anyway, Beit Shammai says you can stay married, Beit Hillel says you can't. What if Rachel was forbidden to Levi? So Rachel is married to Reuven, Leah is married to Shimon, and what happens when Reuven and Le Shimon die? Rachel only has Zika to Yehuda, not to Levi, because she's an Esau Erva to Levi, right? She could be his daughter or something like that, who married her uncle, Reuven originally, and now she doesn't have any Zika to Levi. Leah still has Zika to Yehuda and to Levi. So what happens? So Yehuda can't marry either one of them. But 
Leah can marry, um, sorry, Levi can marry Leah because, right? Because what's the issue? Levi and Leah, Leah only has Zika, Levi only has Zika to Leah and not to Rachel. So because of that, mutar ba'achota, right? So, so let's read it again. If one of them is forbidden to the other, then a sul, then a echad isur erva, sorry, a lachad isur erva, a sul ba umutar ba'achota. Okay, so Levi is forbidden to Rachel because it's Isor Erva, but permitted to Leah. Vahashemi, but Yehuda, because he has Zika of two sisters on him, is a soul b'shtehen. He can't marry either one of them because Rachel, even though she's forbidden to Levi, she still has to be even with Yehuda, and therefore the Zika of both. Next, Haita Achad Mehen Asura Al Haechad Isor Mitzvah Isor Kedusha. Remember this? This is a either. Right, assuming we go with the Mishnah's interpretation, Yisur Mitzvah is Shniot, right? The Derabanans, and Yisur Kedusha is that it's an Isurei Lav. She can't marry. Then that already we said is a different category. So now what happens? So if she is Mitzvah or Kedusha, now we have a bit of an issue. I had a hard time trying to figure out how to draw this with Zika because there's Doraita and there's Derabana. On a Derabana level, she can't. She uh, can't marry any one of them. But on a Torah level, she actually can marry them because she's not prohibited mid oraita to marry them. So on a Torah level, there's Zika to both. On a rabbinic level, she actually can't marry Le- Levi. So because of that, Leah has to do Chalitza because again, she has a problem that maybe she's a kook to both and therefore we have an issue. So now, uh, based on this, Right. Also, by the way, Rachel would do chalitza in that case. Okay, so they both have to do chalitza because there's things going on at a rabbinic level and things going on at a Torah level, and they seem to contradict. Right, on a Torah level, theoretically, they could both do yibum. On a rabbinic level, they right one can, one can't. Okay, so we're going to end up saying basically, right, on a rabbinic level, it's like the previous case where in the end Leah really could do yibum, but because of the Torah level where they both actually have Zika, so we don't allow it at all, and we only allow Chalitza, and in fact, they both do Chalitza in this case, because remember, Isur Mitzvah, Isur Kedusha, you always do Chalitza. That was what we saw when we talked about the Shniel. They always have to do Chalitza. Okay, that's the first part of the Mishnah. Now we get to this other case. Haita Echat Me, and that's not actually the first part, I don't know why I said that. We're, we're already into the second part of the Mishnah, but now, an outgrowth of this case called both, because here they're going to be both Isur Erva. And here's a case that we brought already. We had this case. This is that complicated Asura Lezeh Muteret Lezeh on Daf Tet. I think it was on the end of Daf Tet a bit. We saw it a few times, I think, already. But let's assume I took the case of, of, the, of a mother-in-law. So Rachel and Leah are sisters. Rachel has a daughter, Reut, and Leah has a daughter, Lufnan. So now, the outgrowth of this case of two sisters married to two brothers, their two daughters were married to the other two brothers. Okay? So, if so how could we have an Erva case? Okay, in the other case, I didn't give you how she's Erva. I just said she's Erva. But here I thought it was better if we kind of played out the whole thing. So I gave a particular case of Erva. So if Reut and Livnat each marry, okay, the R goes with R and L goes with L. So Livnat is Leah's daughter and Reut is Rachel's daughter. So if Rachel marries Reuven and Reut marries Levi and Livnat marries Yehuda and Leah is married to Shimon, Okay, so they're all married to the four brothers. When Reuben and Shimon die, what happens? Rachel and Leah fall to Yibum to Yehuda and Levi. But Rachel can't marry Levi because he's married to her daughter. And Leah can't marry Yehuda because he's married to her daughter, right? For him, it's his mother-in-law. He can't marry her. Therefore, there's only Zika from Rachel to Yehuda because she can't marry Levi. And there's only Zika from Leah to Levi because she can't marry Yehuda. And therefore, we'd end up saying... Right? Asura lezeh muteret lezeh. The one who's forbidden to one is permitted to the other, and the one who's asura lezeh muteret lezeh. The one who's forbidden to Leah is permitted to, um, right, sorry, the one who Leah is prohibited to is, uh, sorry, now I got a little confusing. Each one is permitted to the one that the other one is prohibited to. Okay, so Rachel can marry Yehuda and not Levi, and Leah can marry Levi and not Yehuda. Okay? That's our case. Okay, so that's the end of the Mishnah. So, uh, and then we forgot to read the last words. V'zoi shamru, and this is the case that they say. There's a word on the street about this case is 
This is the case of Achota, Keshihi Yavivta, we saw this before, right? Her sister, who is her Yavama, meaning they both fall to Yibum to the same people. She can even do Yibum in this case, even though she's her sister. Normally sisters can't do Yibum. They have to do Chalitza, like we saw in the, in, the, in the first case in the Mishnah. But this is an exception to the rule because each one is forbidden to the other one. Therefore, they can do it. Gemara. Shmami now. And now we're going to understand, and this is a good review of what we saw already. One can infer from here, Yesh Zika. Right? Everything I showed you on those charts was all based on Zika. Right? If there wasn't Zika, this wall wouldn't be relevant. If you weren't, again, what's Zika? You're connected to the husband you're supposed to be marrying, right? The man you're supposed to be marrying. It's as if he's your husband already. That's why Levi and Yehuda both had Zika from two women because they were supposed to marry them. There's already a connection. If there was no connection. There would be no problem. To eat ain't Zika, because if there wasn't Zika, Leia and Rachel come from two different spouses. So each brother, right, or... Each brother should do Yibum with the other, right? They can't marry both. But Levi can marry one, right? Leah. And Yuda can marry Rachel, you know, assuming there's no erva a regular case. No problem, because there is, you know, one does Yibum for Reuven and one does Yibum for Shimon. If there's no Zika, they're not connected to the other woman, unless they did Yibum and they didn't do Yibum with them, right? You do Yibum with one and not the other. Hadi Yabim Chad, Hadi Yabim Chad. Each one could just do Yibum on the other. It should be fine. So now the Gemara says, no. No, I can explain it with Einzik, and we've seen this before already. It's review. We worry that if we allow, let's say, Rachel to do Yibum with Levi, what might happen? We might mess up the whole mitzvah of Yibum for Leah. Why? Before Yehuda does Yibum with Leah, maybe Yehuda will die. Remember we talked about this, the warrior? If Yehuda were to die, what would happen? Leah will fall to Yibum to Levi. Levi's already married to her sister Rachel because he, he did Yibum with her. He won't be able to do Yibum with her until end up being exempt without anything, and which is okay. But we end up missing the opportunity to do Yibum. We'd rather just say both do Chalitza so that we don't have that problem. To which the Gemara says, Well, then you could have just given a case where there were only three brothers to begin with and they both fall to one brother and one Right? We basically should say he should do chalitza to both because better to do that than to be mevatal mitzvah yibum and he shouldn't do yibum to one of them. Would have been the same thing. So we say, well, lo mevaya kamina. Lo mevaya tzvata devadai batla mitzvah yivami. If there's one, then of course batla mitzvah yivami. But, aval arba'a, let me tell ochashina. But maybe you'd say, why should we worry that maybe who is going to die in between before he does yibum? What's the likelihood that after the first one does yibum, before he gets to do yibum, he's going to die? It's unlikely. That's why the Mishnah gave us a case of four. Teach you, even in that case, we're going to worry. So, if that's so, well then, if you're worried and you're worried about all possibilities, we should be worried also in a case of five. Why didn't it tell us five brothers? And even if there's three, maybe Yehuda and Yisachar will die. To which the Gemara says, Lamita de Trelo Cheshina. No, that far we're not going to worry. We're not going to worry that two brothers are going to die. If there's five brothers, then we're going to allow it. Uh, and that's only if we hold Ein Zika. So we have two tracks, either Yesh Zika, and that's the whole premise of the Mishnah, or Ein Zika, and the concern is Mitzvah Levatel Mitzvah Yivamim, uh, Sur Levatel Mitzvah Yivamim. We can't do something which might cause the whole Mitzvah of Yibum to go out the window, and that would be if Yehuda were to die, or obviously if there's only three brothers and one would do it, and then it would prevent the other, right, it would prevent the other wife from getting Yibum, so we wouldn't do that either. Now we're going to start a, a, another case, okay, which we're going to start today. We're going to see Rav, and then we're going to see Shmuel on it. Shmuel, we're only going to start a little bit today. We're going to have a much better interpretation of him tomorrow. We're going to really try to understand, and we're going to have two different interpretations. Rav here, we're going to have first an assumption about what he says, and then we're going to change the assumption and switch it into a different case because we're going to have a problem with the first understanding. This case, we have five brothers, and we have three sisters. So Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Yisachal. And Tamar, Ruth, and Yael. Ruth and Yael. So, Shlosha Chayot Yivamot Shenaflu Lifne Shne Achim Yivamim. Okay, now what happens? Zecholetz Lechat, Vezecholetz Lechat. Okay, so three are married to three brothers, and then we're left with Reuven and Shimon. Usually our cases are Reuven and Shimon are married. In this case, I did it differently because you'll see the Gemara is going to use Reuven and Shimon later. So as the people who have to do Yibum. So that's why I left it different. That's why I made it different this time. So now what happens? 
So three sisters, Yivamot, Naflu Lifnei Shneachim. They fall to Yibam to two brothers. Because what happens? There's five brothers. Three of the brothers die, the ones who are married. Their three wives fall to Yibam to Reuven and Shimon. So now, Zika, what does that mean? Through Zika, Tamar has Zika to Reuven and Shimon. Ruth has Zika to Reuven and Shimon. And Yael has Zika to Reuven and Shimon. So now what happens? What do we do? So, we take the first two. Reuven does chalitza to Tamar. Shimon does chalitza to Ruth. And it doesn't really matter the order here because we're assuming right now all the brothers died at the same time. Reuven does chalitza to one. Ruth does, uh, Shimon does chalitza to the other because we already learned. In this case, because they have Zika of two women on them. At this point, Yael has Zika to Reuven and Shimon. What's the issue here? The issue is like this. At this point, Reuven and Shimon really shouldn't do chalitza, uh, sorry, can't do yibum to Yael. Why can't they do yibum? Because this is what we call achot chalitza to. Okay? Theoretically, both brothers have zika, but she, right, they, they've gotten rid of the zika of Tamar, they've gotten rid of the zika of Ruth. Theoretically, they could marry Yael, but there's a separate problem, which is a Durabana, we've talked about this before, achot chalitza to. If you do chalitza to a sister of hers, it's as if you were kind of married to them, which means you can't marry their sister. So, the, unless Tamara or Ruth were to die, they can't do Yibam with Yael. So, if they don't do Yibam, what do they do? They do Chalitza, obviously. But what's the problem? Rav is going to raise this issue that when you do Chalitza to, uh, um, when you do Chalitza, when you can't do Yibam, okay, Yibam is always, you're supposed to do Yibam, but you do Chalitza instead. It's a replacement. But if you do it in a way that you couldn't, you couldn't have done yibum, and you do chalitza as a as a last resort because you can't do yibum. Then your chalitza is what's called in the learned words of the Gemara. We're going to see it soon. A chalitza psula, which doesn't mean usually psula means disqualified. It's just a weakened chalitza. So let's just see what happens here. Reuven does chalitza with Yael. That's called a chalitza psula because Tamar already did. He already did chalitza with her sister, so he's not really allowed to marry Yael. If he can't marry Yael, his chalitza is weaker. What does it mean? It's weaker. Well, it cut the zika between Reuven and Yael. You see, it's not there anymore, just the chalitza shoe. But the connection between her and Shimon doesn't get erased by this chalitza. It's not strong enough. So that's why it says, em chalitza mishnehem. Reuven and Shimon each need to do chalitza with the last one. It says em se'i, which means the middle. What it means is the one who was left at the end, really. Okay? It's, there's the one on this side, the one on that side, the one in the middle who didn't have chalitza yet. She needs chalitza from both. That's what Rab. That's what Rabbah says. Rabbah bar Rav Huna says in the name of Rav. Comes Rabbah, Amr le Rabbah. Rabbah says to him, Midika Amar Te'emsa, and now he's going to explain this, okay, which I already explained, but I want it was hard to read through that without explaining it. So now he's going to explain. He says, Midika Amar Te'emsa Yitzricha Chalitza Mishnehem. Kasafar Yesh Zika. It must be you hold that there's Zika, because that whole thing doesn't make sense if you didn't hold Zika. The whole reason to make her do Chalitza from both is to get rid of the Zika. And you'd also have to say, psula. And the chalitza between Reuven and Yael was only a weakened one, which is why she needed another chalitza from Shimon. The chalitza psula, you must hold. When you do a weakened chalitza, it must mean Yael has to go to all the other brothers. So if there were five more brothers, she'd have to get chalitza from all of them. But I have a question on that, comes Rabbi. And he says, Then, Reuven should have had to do chalitza with Tamar, Yael, and Ruth. And Shema would have to do chalitza with Tamar, Yael, and Ruth because all their husbands died at the same time. Which means, from the beginning, they were all connected. He couldn't have married any of them. And if he couldn't have married any of them, any of their chalitzas were only chalitza psula, which because there was no potential for yibum, which means that in all these cases, they should have to do chalitza from both, both of the men. So, to which he answers... If the case is as we said, then you're right. Then this picture is wrong, and Reuven would have to do chalitza to both. Shema would have to do. I'm sorry, Reuven would have to do chalitza to all three women, and Shema would have to do chalitza to all three women. You're right. But Lotzricha, what I was talking about is dinafel It's when they fell to Yibum one after the other. Meaning, okay, Levi dies first, for example. Tamar, his wife, Reuven does chalitza with Tamar right away. Which means <coughs> when he did chalitza before the next brother died, there was no achotz kukato. She didn't have a sister that was also 
stuck to, right, with Zika to Ruvain, where, or to Shimon, right, to any, well, I guess to Ruvain, in which case, it's a perfectly good chalitza, because theoretically, you could have even married her. Now, the next thing that happens is Yehuda dies, and then, so right, let's read inside, Nafalchada, chalitz la Ruvain, right, so after the first one dies, Ruvain does chalitza to her. Nafli idach, the second one dies, notice they don't have names in the Gemara, but Ruth dies. Nafla, right, chalatla, sorry, nafla idach, so the second one falls to Yibum, chalatla Shimon, Shimon does chalitza with Ruth. Nafla idach, now when Yisachar dies, we're left with Yael. So until now, we were good. Chalitzas were perfectly fine. There was only Zika of one person at a time. But now Yael di- Yael's husband dies, Yisachar, and Yael needs, she's stuck now because now it's not the issue that there's Zika of two sisters, it's the issue of achot chalitza tel. Right, where they already did chalitza with her sister, each one, there's only two brothers left, and there's one more extra person here of the woman. She needs chalitza either from a third brother, which there is none, or from, right, it would have to be a sixth brother from the beginning, or each of them are going to have to do chalitza, and therefore, hi, mafka, uh, chalitza lahai, so Reuben does chalitza with her, mafka zikato, he gets rid of the zika, and chalitza lahai, Mafkir Zikato, right? So Reuben and Shimon both have to do Chalitza with Yael. Okay. Next. Shmuel Amal. Oh, so now the Gemara asks, Bahama Rav and Zika. But wait, this whole thing was based on Zika. And Rav doesn't hold Zika. So now we're really stuck because we just explained this whole thing based on Rav holding Zika. So no problem. The Diver HaOmer Yesh Zika Kamar. There is someone who holds, the, there's a debate about what Rav actually held. So there, it's it's according to the one who holds their Zika. Ushmuel Amal, and we'll just start with Shmuel now, but we'll explain it much better next time. Because there's going to be two different explanations. Echad cholets the kulan. So we're building on the last case now, where one dies, Reuben does chalitza with Tamar. Yehuda dies, Shimon does chalitza with Ruth. Then Yisachar dies. What happens? Echad cholets the kulan. Reuben can do chalitza. Ah, so wait, I said it wrong here. The chart wasn't wrong. Let's check. Right, sorry. Reuben did Chalitza with Tamar. When Yehuda dies, Reuben does Chalitza with, Reuben, with Ruth also. And then when Yael dies, Reuben does Chalitza with her as well. What Shmuel is saying is not that this is what has to be, but one could potentially do Chalitza with all three. We're going to have to understand what Shmuel is basing this on, right? Possibly Ein Zika, because if there's no Zika, then Reuben has no problem doing Chalitza with all of these women, even if, let's say, they all die at the same time. Anyway, we'll get to understanding Shema much better in tomorrow's class when we get to two different interpretations of what really Shmuel said. With that, we'll end today's shir. Have a Shavuot Tov, Shabbat Shalom to everyone.